Okay, thank you so much. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu wa rasulillah. So, of course, um, all praises for Allah and peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, first of all, the uh, setup here you guys have is real cool. Um, I, I also do homeschooling. Um, I have two kids. My son is seven and my daughter is two. And a half. Oh, she's three actually now, just turned three on the 15th. But my son is, the, is the, my, my main student and um, we do full-time homeschooling. So that means all of his subjects, science and math and, and all of the other stuff, English and reading and stuff we do at the house, as well as some religious studies, Islamic studies and Quran memorization, Arabic language and stuff like that. So um, it's something that I do every day almost with him. So uh, this is a real nice opportunity to kind of see what you guys are doing for your homeschooling. And you know what's really cool actually is um, it's uh, the idea of learning at home or with family. When you look at a lot of the, um, the big scholars of the past, like Muslim scholars, regardless of what their, their field of, of expertise was in, uh, but in particular the religious sciences, when you look back uh, over the history of uh, Muslim history, you, you see that most of, if not all of the really big, well-known, famous scholars that have lasted throughout the, the, the ages, when they write their biography, they always say their first teacher was, who do you think? Their parents? Their, one of their parents their mother or their father or their grandparent or their uncle or their grandfather or someone in their family that began uh, their education, that began teaching them and imparting knowledge and wisdom to them that they had acquired from perhaps their parents before. And so it becomes a real, um, a real enriching family experience that you're learning from your, you know, your, your, your parents have the opportunity to, to be a part of your development and your growth. And it's really, you know, kind of, it's kind of a new concept that, you know, you, you actually go out and you go off to school and you, and you, you know, you, you, you learn from strangers and people that aren't as, as in, attached and involved and invested in you. And you could see that there would be a disconnect of sorts. Strangers. <laughs> so yeah, they're essentially strangers. And, and the only time that historically that they would do that is when the parents exhausted themselves and they didn't have anything else to teach. It's like, look, I've given you all that I had and you're ready to move. Essentially, you're ready to graduate. So now we're going to find someone who's more qualified and knowledgeable and then, and then you can go spend some time with them. And it was always a real close a relationship that the teacher had with the student as opposed to kind of what we're used to now. We go for a, a semester or, or a year and we... We see the teacher and we sit in the class and then we move to another one and then we kind of like, we'll forget um, teachers along the way and they'll forget students along the way. Um, so that's a really, um, you know, it's a really cool thing to do and to be a part of as a family. And hopefully you guys are, are enjoying it, um, you know, to be able to be in a comfortable environment and, and, and appreciate your parents for, for doing that for you. So anyway, today... Um, um, I have a couple of things that I wanted to talk about with you, and this is part of the true identity um, kind of series that was started a couple of years ago. And um, as uh, I've heard, and I'm I'm pretty up to date on is uh, you must who created the name true identity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because it sounds kind of Hollywood, doesn't it? Sound Hollywood? Yeah. yeah, it does sound like it would be like up on a true eyes. Yeah, true identity. <laughs> Something. True identity. Yeah. Like like one of those uh, Jason Bourne. Yeah. Uh, yeah. True identity. Big serious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this true identity and this topic today is going to be, I think, one of the most uh, kind of crucial topics to arriving at true identity. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe you'll understand a little bit more here. Beyond ordinary. What's that? Oh, that looks cool too. All right, so this is a, this is kind of a real a real interesting um, a real interesting kind of 
I guess you could say, way of looking at yourself and, and, and life. In terms of comparison to other things, like creatures that are out there. You know, Allah made, He made everything. He made all of the creatures, all of the creation was, was made. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He made it, them, designed them in a specific way, designed us in a specific way. And, and you know that everything has its function, has its role to play, has a job to do. That was the basic design. So some things there have very kind of mun, a mundane existence, just kind of, it's just there. <clears throat> they, do have, they do have roles to play in, in, in existence. But there are some things that are just there. They're just considered to be ordinary. You know, they have a one, one, it's like, it's not a dynamic, it's not a very dynamic existence. It's just very static. That's just what you do, like a rock, for example. You know, like a rock is just, a, it's just there. It's just going to be a rock. That's what it's going to do its whole life, its career. It's like, hey, wh what do you do? Uh, well, I'm a rock. And so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Meet, meet, Mr. meet the rock, yeah. So like, I'm a rock, so what can, what can you do? So well, well, I can be a rock, and you can do some things like you can put stuff on top of me, or you can hit me on things to use. But essentially, it's always going to be a rock, right? I mean, it's going to fulfill the purpose that it was designed, and it's not going to change all of a sudden to be a flower. I mean, at least in my experience. I mean, from my understanding, I mean, maybe you know more than I do about rocks and, and that kind of thing, that there was a rock that turned into a flower at some point. But as far as I know, that's never happened. And so we're never going to try and repurpose the rock, are we? If you're like going to give a gift, like, you know, <laughs> imagine, imagine like you, you, your mom, you know, you say, hey, mom, I got you, a, um, I know it's like a special day, I want to give you a gift, so uh, I got you a rock. It could be a diamond. It's technically a rock. It could, sure, it could be. Okay. But let's think about the just the normal old rock. Right? Don't, <laughs> would you take a diamond and, and pound on a nail to, to drive it into the... the you take a, like a, let's take a rock. Use a diamond, as as you, you, know, you, got, you got a point. You got so a point. I could use a diamond. You guys are always so tricky, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're so tricky. <clears throat> but typically... Yeah, sure, you could give a diamond as a gift. That'd be a rock. But... Normally when people give like a little gift, I mean, did you buy your mom a diamond before? No. No. <laughs> well, okay, I'm, alhamdulillah, because I was worried. <laughs> no. I thought maybe I'm sitting with people I don't really understand who they are. <laughs> yeah. People normally give like flowers or they give like a something, you know, something else in the form of a gift. Maybe your dad, he gave, it, he gave that type of rock before. <laughs> yeah. Normally the, the husband has to give that type of rock to the wife as a gift. But normally you would give flowers and you wouldn't try to repurpose those things. They, every, everything has their place, everything has their design. And so today's kind of uh, topic is about beyond ordinary and that is uh, us as creatures are, are kind of beyond the ordinary. Right? And so here's an interesting exercise. Ordinary. You see that, that picture there? It's kind of starting to come into shape there. Can you figure it out? I. Man, smart people. <laughs> oh, I just guessed. You did. Uh, you did guess. You got a. You got a good guess there. You can see some of the. No, it's mushroom. It looks like mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a mushroom. It's not a mushroom. Or like a donut or something. You know? It looks like it could be a hole in the ground. Like there's the dirt and then it's falling in. So, kind of uh, the reality of our, our, our existence is, is or, or our understanding of our existence is our perception on, uh, 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 our perception on reality, right? The reality of our lives. And one of the things that, that kind of uh, makes us beyond ordinary is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has distinguished us and made us different from the rock, for example, or even the diamond, for example, or the flowers that you give, or the candies, or, or whatever. And that Allah, He's given us a number of tools that He did not give other creatures. And those tools, they distinguish us, and they help us fulfill a greater purpose, and to, of course, arrive at being able to understand who we are. 
So here we have uh, the ability to think and to ponder. And you guys have already exercised that a number of times since we began. You know, with the exercise of the rock, you changed it into a diamond. Uh, though you've never actually done that's theoretical it's not practical yet you haven't done that inshallah you do that one day um, I, my, I can give you my address <laughs> if you want to send me a gift because it sounds like you're a good gift giver you know why are we here why are we created what, what is our what is our kind of our design like what was the intent behind our design like the rock has a number of things that can be done with it and that's kind of limited. It's limited as to what it can do. The human being is similar in that it is a creature. We are just limited to our abilities. We cannot go beyond them. Even our intellect has, has a certain limit. There's parameters to it. Like our eyesight and our hearing, there's parameters to that. That we can't go beyond. You know, um, I don't know um, how, familiar you are, how familiar you are with um, exercise and and. and like lifting weights and stuff? You look like you might be into weightlifting. No. I don't no? Oh. I just, I know about it. Okay, you, you're familiar with uh, that kind of thing, aren't you? Me? Yeah. Yeah, like, sort of. <laughs> but I, mean, going to have I mean, you know what, like, lift the, the, the machines, you know, you get on the machine and like you, you, they have exercise and there's like little weights here on the side. Yeah, yeah. Right, and you gotta take the pin out and mm -hmm. you put it in. And so when you first start, you, you start at the, the lightest weight, you know? It's like a little one bar, you put it in there and you say, okay, this is easy. And then you go down and you're like, oh, it's getting a little bit more tough and a little more resistance. And then, and then you get, I mean, these little things, they're small little pieces of, of steel or whatever. You keep going and you can do so much of it. And then you get to one more, one more bar and then you're, <coughs> oh, you're like, hey, it doesn't work, right? It's stuck. You're stuck there. So that is a display of those types of limitations that we, we, we're constantly working within those, uh, within those limitations, which can be pushed and directed and, and, and strengthened just like these types of things we're talking about. And this is what distinguishes us in a very, very raw and natural way, that we have these tools that we're able to do that. And so you are right. This is an eye. One of the tools for, for acquiring information, eyesight. One of the great blessings that Allah has given us is to, to be able to see and to kind of take in our environment and, and, and the things that are around us to process uh, our reality through eyesight. So there's something interesting that in the Arabic language and in the Quran it's mentioned also that there's, um, there's a, a type of, of sight, basar, which is, which is what you visually see. And then there's another type of sight which is mentioned called basira. And this is like insight. And we also use this in English. A person has sight and then a person has insight into something. And they're very different. They're very different. Someone can physically see something and not comprehend what it is or understand how it operates, the function, the design, the purpose behind it. And then someone could see something and they could have this basira, this insight, and they could truly understand and they can, they can marvel over it. They could see, wow, this is amazing. This is truly amazing. Something great. Like right? Painting, right? Who's, uh, whose calligraphy is that? From back home. Yeah? Some people just see it as, okay, it's painting, that's it. You're right, you're right. Some people might just look at it and they would say, uh, oh, look at the colors, they look great. They do look great, by the way. Um, and then somebody might see it and they would see the writing on it and they'd say, what was that writing? It looks like a nice script. Yeah, they don't actually understand what it is, but it just looks kind of nice, you know. It's, each one has a different script. And then someone might come in and they'd say, oh, I can read that. they say, well, hey, watch this, I can read that. It's the second level. Yeah, yeah, they say, hey, look, I can read that. And they'll read it. They'll say, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةِ وَرَحْمَةِ It's the middle one. So, okay, great. You know how to read that. Oh, well, well, hold on. I didn't say I understood it. I said I could read it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm just able to read it because I know alphabet. Yeah, so I read it. So I got a, I, there's a, you can see that the levels of, of this type of 
you know, insight into things. One person just sees colors, one person sees colors in writing, another person says, oh, I can even read it. Another person, he comes and says, well, no, I, I, I understand that. I know what that means. It says, وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّ وَرَحْمِ says, and we have made between you love and mercy. He says, we have made between you, you, love and mercy. Okay, so I just told you what it means. Someone could further come and say, well, actually, you know, I could tell you a little bit more about that. I could tell you a little bit more about that. What it's talking about. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّ وَرَحْمَةً that I place between you, uh, uh, love and mercy. It's talking about between the husband and the wife. I can, someone could come and say, oh, well, I can tell you the, 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 the grammatic structure of that sentence. And to the end of it, until someone that has pieced all of these things together, they've, they've gathered some from here and from there and from there, and they've been able to process all of that information, what they saw, what they heard, and then they, then they pondered and reflected over it, and then they got the point. They, they grasped the actual point of that, those words. You, have, you just have four words there. They understood what those four words meant. Not just literally, but the purpose behind them. Why are those four words there? Well, that's the thing, right? That's kind of the thing. Those four words are there for decoration. I mean, for some people, they would be there for just decoration. I mean, they look nice. I mean, the painting's great. But then those four words could mean a lot more to someone that has insight into the, the meaning and the purpose of them. And that is what we're looking at here with this eye. And that we're looking to have a type of, not just sight, but we want to have insight. We don't just want basar. We want basira. We want to have insight so that we can, we can have a true understanding of, of our design and, and, our, and our purpose. Kind of who we are, who we're supposed to be. You guys understand where I'm going with so far? Yeah. What's that mean? What's that mean? Do you remember? Love and mercy. Love. <laughs> Love. <laughs> What else? What else? Love and rahmah. Mercy. mercy. You, can't have, you can't have love without mercy. You've got to have both. Always keep that in mind. If you, if you have love, there's got to be mercy. One day there might not be love anymore. You might fall out of love. But then you're stuck with this person. <laughs> then you've got to be merciful. Otherwise, it's going to be all downhill after that. All right? So with, with basira, look here. It says, we see what others don't see. Okay, with insight, we're able to see beyond just the colors and just the calligraphy. We're able to see beyond just the literal meaning of things. Yep, beyond the surface. Right? Yeah, of course. Beyond what's just surface level, we're able with insight to see into in depth as to the design, the intricacy of it, the, the purpose of it, the intent behind its creation and exi its existence. And that's the importance of insight have to identify that. And the sooner you identify that in life, the easier it is for you to, to, to continue on. To, to begin to, to, to realize your goals and your vision, to realize your purpose, your direction. I'll tell you, in my personal experience, um, I went all the way through, and not, not that I've reached at a level where I know exactly where I'm going and, and I know my, my purpose in life and, and, and what, I, what I'm going to be doing down the road. No, but... Um, at one point in my, I guess, up till I was in college, I had no idea whatsoever. No idea whatsoever. I didn't know where I came from. I didn't, I mean, I mean, I know where, where I came from. But I don't know where we as human beings came from. Why were we here? What was our, what was our purpose of life? What was the, why were we in existence? I mean, and... And all I was able to do was just to see things around me as they were, surface level, and not able to really understand anything more in depth than that without insight, right? And insight is something that you have to acquire. You look again, right? Perception. This is your perception. With this insight, 
you are able to gain a perception, a perspective of, of life. So the question is, what kind of perception do we have? How do we perceive the world? You know, how do we perceive ourselves? How do we perceive one another? Perception is essentially all that it comes down to. It all comes down to your perception, your perspective. What do you see? What do you identify? What do you read from a certain, some, from a certain thing? Have you ever had a situation happen where you perceive something to be and then you find out it's actually the opposite of that? Anyone have, have that happen before? Maybe. Come on. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. You thought something was going down, and then it turns out, man, I was way wrong on that. I thought she was doing this and that and the other, and then I found out actually it was, it was quite different. My perception was way off. It was way off. You know, I thought you said to me, you know, when you were texting me, I thought you said, you fill in the blank. I can help you. You like wasabi, right? <laughs> so it looks like so sweet. When you taste it, like what? You know wasabi is like... Uh, can you it's like a mustard. What wasabi is? Yeah, it's like a Japanese. Yeah. It looks like... Um, She's into Japanese thing. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah, we did. We did have a friend who thought it was green tea ice cream. And he ate the whole thing. Exactly. <laughs> green tea ice cream. Started crying. Yeah, because it was so spicy. You're not supposed to eat that all at once. <laughs> wow, that's that's dangerous. You know, perception, <laughs> perception can can get you, you bad perception can get you into trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Green tea ice cream. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. No, a person eat the wasabi and. Yeah, but he thought it was green tea ice cream. He thought, he thought he <laughs> swallowed the whole thing. Yeah. He was yeah. Young. Swallowed the whole thing. <laughs> and then he was enjoying the aftertaste, then, right? The after effect. Because he was like in front of uh, all of us. Yeah. And he was trying to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> and he was just eating it instead of spitting out. <laughs> wow. Good. So he so here here, this is where this is good. That's excellent. That's an excellent example. That's an excellent example, right? I was looking for something like with your friends because that happens a lot i mean he was our friend well, no, i mean like not this is very nice this is a very nice example but I, what i was looking for is like something that happened with you and your friend Commun you know what communication this often happens especially text messaging ah. texting you can totally just get messed up yeah. because you don't hear tone of voice you don't see a person's face you don't understand uh you context. know context perhaps they write something and you get mad you're like, I can't believe they said that. They just text that to me. And then you're like, oh, well, what? I just meant like this. And you're like, oh, well, when you say it like that, it seems a lot better. But probably the wasabi one was cooler <laughs> than what I was trying to go for. You guys are so tricky, man. Always tricky, this group. All right. So in order to, um, in order to really gain a true perspective, um, we have to go to the beginning. The beginning of things. So here we have the beginning of creation. Well, Surface. there we go. Yeah. So this is talking about the broader picture of existence, you know. I mean, if, the, if how old was the guy or girl? Who was it that he, it was a guy, right? Oh, okay. Well, he's still too young to really, to be able to kind of harness the power of inquiry. But, you know, normally you would ask, you would, you would say, oh, what is this? You would say, oh, that's wasabi. You'd say, oh, I, I've never heard of that. So w what's in it? And then you, you kind of ask, like, what, what's there? What's it made of? And, wh and then you might ask, like, I'll, I'll be honest, like, um, in my community, we have a lot of people from Pakistan and India, and they love really spicy food. And I, I'm, I don't, I can't really, I can't really enjoy it because I didn't grow up eating it. Like apparently they feed their babies hot stuff on the way 
through their elementary years and stuff. And so I learned from now on that I start asking. I said, if it's a sauce or, you know, there's a lot of different sauces that, that some cultures have. They, have they, they give you rice and it seems plain and they give you like four or five different sauces to use with it. And so I, now I start asking, okay, what's this? And they say, oh, this is ginger sauce and this is yogurt sauce and this is pepper sauce and this is, so I'll ask. And I, I started to think, you know, oh, ginger sauce, that's ginger, that's good. I can do that one. You know, you have yogurt sauce, that sounds fine. You have pepper sauce, that sounds fine. And then, so I started to do it on my own. And turns out the ginger sauce was very spicy and the pepper sauce that I thought was hot was actually sweet. <laughs> so my perception was very wrong. So I started to ask, I said, listen, what's this? They would say, this is ginger. I said, what do you use it for? Like, do you put it on your rice or is it for a dessert or is it hot or is it, is it, is it mild or, or what? And so then they would say, oh, well, this is what it is. They would start to tell me exactly how it was made, what it's for, what's it, what's it used, how it's eaten, and all that kind of thing. So when we move away from that kind of perspective or look and we look at ourselves, we have to ask the same things. The same things we have to ask. Where did we come from? Why are we, what, what is the purpose of our design? What is the purpose of our existence? And, and for that reason, you can see that in the Qur'an, a number of times Allah refers to the creation of the human being. He refers to the creation of man. And He talks about details, very specific details of that creation. And it's through those details that we get to know our origins, where we're from, which is a very important question to be answered. Most every human being wants to know that. They want to know where did I come from, not just my parents, but you know, how how am I here? And, and, and you probably asked at some point, you know, how do we get here? You know, and in schools, I mean, in the, in the, in the, here in the United States, which you're, you're very aware, well aware of, at the young ages, they tell you that a bird called a stork, he had a baby in his mouth and he brought it to the house and placed it in, in, the, in the house. And that's what they tell a lot of kids at the young age, because they don't want to talk about the the details of all that, you know, your mom was pregnant and this and that and that what was before that and then all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so everyone wants to know and kids at a young age, they begin to ask their parents, well, how did I get here? Or their brother, how, well, what's going on? So they ask, we ask, we are, we, we are already kind of designed to inquire these types of things. We're designed to inquire that. So Allah tells us very specifically, look here, he says, that we then form the drop into a clot, and form the clot into a lump, and form the lump into bones, and clothe the bones in flesh, and then brought him into another, into a being as another creature, blessed be Allah, the best of creators. So it's here that we find our origins, our origins, where we began. And we began where? Where did we begin? Because this is going to help us uh, determine where we'll, where we'll end. Our beginning helps us a lot in determining where we're going to end. Where do we begin? Look, tell me. The fetus. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> don't think, don't think book science too much. That's all I know. Right, because look, remember the book science. The book science is often it's surface level. It just tells you the one plus one equals two. Right, it just tells you that. We're looking to have insight into the origins of things. We want to go to the deep core of things, the root of things. Where did we begin? Hmm? Look at the very first word. What does it say? We. we. And who's that? says, we then form the drop into a clot. Who's that referring to? Allah. It's referring to Allah. And Allah is referring to Himself in this manner. In, in English it says we. But it's one. Of course, this is, this is called the royal, royal. royal we. Yeah. It means a noble and exalted, high and mighty. And so Allah says, we then formed. Right. So Allah is telling us that our very origins are from Allah's creation. That it was He that did the one plus one equals two, the, the, the scientific surface level. There's an egg and there's a sperm and they go together and they mix and they form, as it says here, is in a, is a drop into a clot and clot into a lump, lump into bones, bones with flesh. 
the very real fleshy stuff. That's the worldly stuff. You know, that's like the, the painting. That's like the, 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 the calligraphy. But it's not the deep meaning of it. We didn't get to the deep part of it yet with just this stuff. And this is the problem that we, we have a lot of times with our perspective or our, our perception of things is that today you'll notice that the, the trend the trend is to just stay surface level. Surface level. Let's just stick with the science. Just stick with the science because the science is it's surface level. It's tangible. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can measure it. You can test it. And it's very easy to do that. I mean, isn't it? Isn't science easy? It depends. Yeah. No, it's easy. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Yeah, it's easy. I mean, you might have a little bit of difficulty getting to a certain level in, in the understanding of science, but once you're there, it's easy, right? I mean, the stuff that you already know, you're like, yeah, of course, that's, I already know that. I mean, I tell you one plus one is, is two, you're like, come on, man, what are, you, what are you saying? Right? I mean, of course it is. It's very easy. Once it's, once it's there, it's easy, but to go beyond something deeper than what's just physical, and measurable then it becomes a bit difficult and that's where insight comes in and that's where the true nature of things are beyond just that of course you need the the one plus one to help you arrive at your conclusions but this is our beginning Allah Allah created us and our reality is that and Allah mentions this not here in this verse but later on is that that is along our journey our final destination will be back to Allah you know we were created by Allah and we'll return back to Allah. So there's something in between. There's something that happens in between. Let's move on here. And Allah wants to lighten for you your difficulties and mankind was created weak. Okay? Giving us, not only does Allah tell us where we came from, but then He tells us the nature of our creation. He created us all of these different ways and then He created us in a weak state. And I hinted at that before with the weights, the weight training. Going one block at a time and then eventually you just get stuck. You can't stop. You can't. You know, and they have a, um, I have a friend. Um, I have a, uh, well, he was a, an old friend, an old, old friend from high school. And um, he's a vegan. You familiar with that? What, what's vegan, you know? Okay, they don't eat meat. They don't eat animal, animal any animal byproducts. Whatsoever. They won't, yeah, the milk, of course, milk is a totally, yeah. No milk, no cheese, no, uh, no eggs. Um, um, they won't eat byproducts either, which is not a direct egg. It's like part of the egg that they put in something else, like candies. They won't use like toothpaste that has animal byproducts or tested on animals, deodorant, soaps. The lifestyle is very, it's kind of restricted in that regard. That they, they're very, very particular about what they use. Not just eat, but use. Like clothing as well. They won't wear leather, like a belt or shoes. They won't wear uh, a suede jacket. They won't wear uh, clothing um, that has some type of animal testing. Of course, fur is, is definitely a, a big no-no for that. Anyway, he's a vegan. And believe it or not, he is a bodybuilding champion. Yes. In the last couple of years, he's become a bodybuilding champion. You know, like Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and those guys. But he's, you know, the vegan one. And there's a couple of these vegans that are starting to come out into this world. So, you know, they do a lot. They, they lift heavy, heavy weights. I mean, they live like, you know, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand pounds of weight, you know, and depending on what they're doing. So he's lifting 500 pounds and he can do it. You know, he's very strong. He can do it. But what... The problem is, the display of his weakness is when you put one extra pound, just one more. You say, wow, you're doing 500 pounds. What happens if I put one more pound on? He can't push it up. One, you see, one more pound. You think 500 pounds, you should be able to add at least another hundred. I mean, because we're dealing with hundreds now, not ones and twos and threes. One more pound and it won't go. It's not just physical weakness, though, that Allah mentions here. This is weakness across the board intellectual weakness, emotional weakness, you know, we have physical weakness. We're just weak, which means if someone's weak, they need 
They need a little bit of help. And they need some help. They need some guidance. Mankind is fragile in nature, requiring guidance and a lot of care to survive. So this is where our perception, our perception needs help. It needs help. Just like uh, your friend who ate the wasabi. I'm like thinking now that I'm sitting here and having experienced similar things, I'm thinking to myself, what were you guys doing when he was getting ready to eat that whole wasabi? He was like, Green tea ice cream. Mmm. What were you guys doing? We didn't Did you were you recording it on YouTube or something? You're like. Realized he was eating it until he started crying, and then we wondered what was wrong with him, and then he told us. Oh, okay. So you're better. You would be, you would have been better friends than that. Yeah. Right. Listen, <coughs> please. If, if I'm gonna consume something here, I want to know about it before I. Or I cry in front of you. I don't want to cry in front of you people. <laughs> so we need some guidance here and, and we need some assistance. We need care, uh, especially when, when developing our perception. We don't want to fall into a, a, bad, a bad situation because we don't, we don't perceive things correctly. Right, perception. So let's look at this. A couple pictures here. What do you got there? You like pizza? No? What if I say it was Japanese pizza? You tell by the mushrooms, those are like. I know what Japanese pizza looks like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not Japanese. I don't even know. What is it then? You tell me. It looks good. I don't care if Japanese or not. It looks good. So what you see is, what do you, what do you think? What do you, I mean, what do you think? Because when I see it, I'm like, wow, that looks really good. Most pizzas don't look as good as that one. Um, I'm used to like, um, Flat pizza. I'm used to like, uh, we got a little place called um, Big Bites. It's called Big Bites. Over there in, 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 in South Jersey. Oh, Big Bites, in South Jersey. Yeah, new, new restaurant, Muslim, uh, Muslim family owned and, and they do the pizzas. And so we get pizzas from them. It's kind of a flat pizza. It's just cheese normally we get. Um, it's kind of the run of the mill. Pizza, but when I look at this, I'm like, that's a gourmet. That looks like a gourmet pizza. I mean, it's got little little leaves on there. Is that bacon? That, halal that's halal, yeah, halal <laughs> bacon, of course. And halal pepperonis, um, and everything is halal and good for this. I haven't seen that one. Huh? I haven't seen that one. You haven't seen that one? Yeah, no, halal pepperoni. Oh, you haven't seen it yet? Oh, well, well, yeah, you need to develop a little better perception on, <laughs> yeah. All right, so we can see it, but what happens when we change this? Check this out. How does it look now? It doesn't look so appealing, right? Yeah. It doesn't look as good. I can't really tell what some of the ingredients are, so I don't know if it's like, it's trash or what, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Some of it looks, it just looks kind of bland. I don't know. I would be like, let's go to Big Bites. Let's just go over from Big Bites. This one's not... Really, really interesting. So this is what we're looking at with our eye. What about when we get even, even worse? Does that look like pizza at all? That looks like somebody ate the pizza and then lost it. Like, goosh. You know, this is without light here. So you're in the dark. You're in the dark right now. So you can see that. And this is kind of, a, a, this is metaphorical, you know. I mean, when we had light, Things were fully lit for us. We could see, we could see the reality of what was in front of us. But you know what? You should try to eat something mm. that light. Try it. You know, I tried it in movie theater when I was a kid. Yeah. It feels weird. Feels weird, huh? I, I ate something that I typically don't like to eat. Mushroom. I, I don't like to eat mushroom, right? Yeah. But because I didn't know it was mushroom. I, yeah, yeah. I kept eating. There's also another restaurant where they like take you. It's like once a month they take you and they blindfold you. Yeah. And they like they take you through the meal. <laughs> <laughs> like you're supposed to enjoy the food more, I guess. Oh, uh, not seeing it. Like, By not seeing it, or enjoy your date less, like without having to see them. Enjoy it. Enjoy the date less. I mean, like not have to interact with your date if you don't like them. So you don't have to look at them. Oh. <laughs> 
Perception. Hey, yeah, you know, different, different things, different things, you know. It's also, um, if you can't smell, that also changes your perception on, on food. You know, if you've ever had a cold and you go to eat something, you, sometimes without smell, you can't really taste that well either. You know, durian fruit? Who? Durian fruit. <laughs> fruit? Fruit. It's called durian. Okay. I will show you later. Okay. I don't know. It's called like a dangerous food. Oh, oh, okay. Dangerous food. But, but I mean, you know, dangerous, you know, because of the taste. You know, you know, Andy Zimmerman, well, what's what, like, he's the one who has... Spike fruits. Call it spike fruits. You know, oh. The the spice. Spice. It's not it's like uh, 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 uh. And yeah. When you open it, they have, you know, call, we call it durian. Yeah. And I know what it looks like. Yeah, I know what you're, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. But, you know, They're not very typical uh, here in the United States. Most, most, most Americans um, are not comfortable with the smell. Yeah. But Asian love it. Yeah. So, no, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. They usually, you know, put it like a milkshake or something like that. Mm. But you can eat it immediately like that. You can just eat it out of the, out of the spiky yeah. shell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the Americans say the worst smell. The worst. I, I couldn't get it at that one. <laughs> Why they, they they say the worst smell? If it's fish, yeah, worst smell. That's understandable. Okay. Calling durian the worst smell is like <laughs> way off. It's way off. Way off. Huh? Way off. Yeah. <laughs> so it, perception. Yeah, you're right. It, perception. <laughs> perception. And and the same thing. Like I said, if you can't smell something, um, I know. If I had a friend who um, is part of his habit when he when he would eat is that he would smell the food. And, and it's kind of like a social no-no, you know. I mean, you imagine like, he's like, yeah, sniffing like, you understand? You, you, the first time you'd be like, okay, what? And then you're like, all right, never mind, because it just happened so fast. But every time he's like, you know, he picks up with his fork and, he, and then he smells it. And then it, and it's like if if he's if someone notices that he's smelling, he's like, okay, they see me smelling it. And then he tries to do it real smooth. He's just like, he picks it up. He's just like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Like, what are you doing, man? Like, I just want to smell it because if I, when I smell it, I can I can kind of tell how it's going to taste. If it's going to be good or not, and it just become a habit. So when there's no smell, then, then your perception on what the food actually tastes like is quite different. Just like light, you can't see the colors. And all of these things are coupled together. All of the senses act in, in conjunction with each other to help develop a perception. Help develop a perception. And then, and then you, have to, you have to process that information. Was it too hot? Was it too sweet? Was it too salty? Was it too whatever? So this type of here, we're talking about light, and we're talking about like a metaphorical light. You know, a metaphorical light, and a lot of times light uh, in, in, in a lot of cultures is used as a metaphor for knowledge. Even in, even in the Arabic world, they say that knowledge is light. Here in America, we say knowledge is power a lot of times. In, 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 the, in the Arab world, or the Muslim world, a lot of times they say, el -il -nur, that knowledge is light. Because knowledge is, is the most crucial tool that a person needs to get on with things. You know, it's kind of like here that to walk or to, 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 to live in, in, in a light, lightened room is, is, is easier to get around. You don't trip, you don't stumble, you don't fall, you know exactly where things are. You know where things go, you know what to do because you can see. But if you open the door and all the lights are off, even in your own home, and, and this is my personal experience in my own home, when I go in at night and we've all been out for the day and hopefully we've turned the lights off to save on the electric bill, <laughs> right? We've, we've all turned the lights off on the way out. When we come back in, even my house I've lived in for a couple of years and I kind of know where things are, I'm still like, I know that, that, that this is here and there's that, but I know the washing machine on my way in, on my way into the house, there's the washing machine and the dryer right here. And there's the storage over here. And then there's the light switch and there's another door to go into the main part of the house. And I know that's there, but I'm still real weary when I walk in without light. Even though I know things are there, I still feel and I'm, I'm like kicking my foot on the ground, you know, to make sure I'm not going to hit 
I don't know what I would hit, another wall that just popped up when I was gone. Someone came in and built a wall or like a, a, a trip wire or something that they could have installed. I don't know. But you still... Toys. Yeah, whatever. It could be anything. You still feel weak and, and lacking. So, you know, once that light switch comes on, you go. You go for it. No problem. You can run through that house, you know. And that's what my, my son does normally, just run right through there. Check this out. Here's another exercise. Try to read this. Can you read that? Hmm? Can you read that? Come on. It's just letter. I mean, you can read. I mean, you do read, right? You're doing school. Yeah, I'm going to read school. Yeah, you're doing school, right? You don't, you don't read yet? I thought you were doing, you're not doing homeschool? What are you doing with these kids, man? <laughs> what are you doing, man? <laughs> you guys are cheating, huh? You've been cheating your dad this whole time. All right, hold on. I'll give you a hand. I'll give you a hand. There we go. There, now you can do it. Easy, easy peasy. Let's go. I don't understand what's taking so long. Speak the truth even if your knees shake and your voice cracks. All right, so if we go back, you know, the first one. The first one, you guys, it, it looked like an ultimate failure from my perspective when I was watching you look at it. It was like, <laughs> like, I, like I know those letters, right? Just like here. I know those letters. I can see that. I just can't make a message out of it. I can't, I can't put it together. Because you, you only had a part you only had a piece of what you needed to, to truly understand. You only had a piece, right? And then, I, then we gave you a couple more pieces. It still wasn't enough, however, for you to put the whole thing together, big picture. What it is, what's the message? And then finally concluded that every piece is there and you got it. Easy, right? Check this out. Next. Mm. Uh huh. Yep. Never mind. You're able to identify these things quite quick. Why is that? Why? You use it all the time. Sure. You're familiar with it. You've already learned. You know what? When they first started doing this, you know, the first time you saw it, you're probably like, what? Yeah. And I remember the first time, LOL, before it, it like spread. When they when we were when we were typing on um, AOL whatever chat or whatever you know one of the first chat AOL yeah AOL America Online yeah. that was one of the first chat um, computer chat services and I remember seeing LOL for the first time and I'm like lol lol and BRB too what bro lol yeah yeah I'm like lol so I remember writing who I went. Who's lol? Because <laughs> it's capital, uh, the capital L made me think it must be a name. Yeah. And maybe they hit the, t the cat blocks button, lol. I was like, who's lol? But I'm talking, I'm like, I said something, I chatted something, it's like, lol. Like, who's lol? They're like, laugh out loud, man. What do you mean, who's lol? <laughs> laugh out loud. And then, uh, then, then, I, then I heard uh, R-O-F-L, R-O, I'm like, Rolf, Rolf? Did somebody misspell Ralph? <laughs> Ralph? Yeah, and I think that was until I got married. Oh. After I got married, I was talking with my wife. I was like, who, what's Ralph? It's like, hey, you better tell me who, who Ralph is. Who is this Ralph guy? <laughs> Rolling on the floor. I'm like, oh, okay. All right, sorry. Never mind. Never mind, right? Hey, never mind. N-V-M. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, right? Okay. <clears throat> so these things we have to be taught. We have to be instructed and we have to be told what to do. The same thing goes here with the babysitter, right? You, you guys babysit before. Yeah? By the way, we have uh, only 30 minutes. You don't have to finish it. All right, we're going to get as far as we can get with this. We're getting close to the end of section one anyway. So you've all babysat before, probably. What happens when you're the babysitter? Oh, 
Whoops. I bet that, that could have happened, right? Look at that. You won't get paid. <laughs> oh, you guys get paid for babysitting? <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, no. It, it, usually, if you babysit like a stranger's child, you get paid. Oh, okay. Yeah. Only in America, Good right? Good Only in America. Good Listen, I had a neighbor one time when I was living in, I was down in North Carolina. They were from India. They were the only, like, kind of foreign neighbors that we had. And uh, as an American, typical American family, we weren't exposed to, like, different cultures and stuff, like most Americans, especially in the South. Up north in New York, it's, like, very vibrant communities, and people are, and they could know as much as they wanted to. And so this Indian family lived right across the street. They were straight Indian, straight up from, like, just came from India, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, she, she was wearing the very traditional Indian dress, and... And, you know, the kids, they had a very heavy accent. They did speak English pretty well, but very heavy accented English. And she used to have the most bizarre things that she would request and want from neighbors. Yeah, it was so weird. One time, she asked my mother for the plants in her yard. You know, we had a yard, front yard, and she, my mother used to be into, um, like, uh, planting and and having nice uh, bushes and trees and stuff, all that kind of stuff. And she said, listen, my son has a, a school play, and uh, we're supposed to bring in plants to put on the stage as part of the scene, and I was wondering if I could borrow your plants. <laughs> my mom's like, uh, she goes, you mean the plants that are in the ground, that are planted in the earth? You want me to dig them up? so that you can take them for the play and then you're going to bring them back and I will replant them again? She's like, yes. <laughs> and my mom was like, uh, I'm sorry, um, I, I can't do that. I mean, that's crazy, they might die. I mean, we've, we've... The other thing was, is she would, and her two kids, they were like uh, elementary school, one was in middle school, sixth grader, I think. She would come over and she would say, um, I'm running to the store. Um, please keep an eye on my kids. And my mom's like, uh, excuse me, what? Yeah, because apparently we're in her neighborhood back home in India, everyone just watches each other's family and kids and stuff, and you don't go, hey, um, uh, I'm going to pay you. No, they never got paid for it. It was just like a, a communal duty, like a neighborly duty. You, you go to the store, you need someone to watch your kids. They're like, all right, we'll keep an eye on them. And then they come back and the kids are there. And they don't pay them money, yeah. right? But for us, that was the strangest, weirdest thing that ever happened. Yeah, like in Indonesia. Yeah. Can, can we stay over one night? Yeah. Suddenly. Shall the sudden. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, like family, but you know, we don't really see them, you know, like probably once a year. Yeah. And you know, one day they, they knock the door. Can we stay overnight without any, you know, phone call or anything? No, no invitation required. No invitation. Yeah, like they're just no, for them, inviting it's, themselves. It's, it's, it's normal. Normal for, behavior. Uh, people who live in the city. Yeah. Uh, what, what are they doing? Yeah. Yeah. Perception. yeah, of course. Over there, it seems very normal. But over here, it seems very odd. And it was, it's almost taboo. It's like, yeah. these are rude people. Yeah. And we used to have a swimming pool in our backyard. We had a swimming pool. And we had a fence around it. <laughs> typically, cool. yeah, typically... Um, a fence around a backyard means private. Like, look, we put a fence up for privacy. Like, uh, that means uh, keep out, yeah. right? Hey, yeah, I mean, that's what fences are for, right? And so she came over one time and she said, um, listen, um, we uh, are having some guests from India and we need to use your pool for a pool party. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Oh just very normal, like, just, no just so normal as yeah, if it was, friend? what was that? No, no. They were new neighbors. To, they just came to the neighborhood first. You know, within the first year, a number of these things happened. Like we didn't, we'd never been to their house. They'd never been to our house. We'd never had any real interaction with them. Just hi, bye along the, you know, on the neighborhood. You know, she comes over. We have uh, friends, uh, family, and friends come from India, and we would like to use the pool for a pool party. And I remember my mother telling me that later on that evening, and she was like, what does this lady think? Like, we're a country club? Like, we're a, like a sports center that we're just letting people come in and out of the place? But for her, the way she did it was just like so normal and so ordinary. And for us, we were just like, 
shocked. Yeah, and it, and, and, and I remember that now. And that was like, I don't know, that was like over 15 years ago. Because I can remember how odd it was. Our perception was so different from her perception. So when you're dealing with something like this, you're babysitting. And that was where we started originally because she asked to f babysit for free, right? Is that a, as a babysitter, you have to help the baby or the, the young kid that you're, that you're watching and looking after because they themselves haven't developed enough and don't perceive the world enough that they could actually harm themselves or they could end up uh, face painting with their pudding, it looks like, and messing up something, you know? So you have to watch out for that. Keep them and protect them and you have to provide guidance for them. Hey, look, don't put your finger there. Hey, stop pulling on that, you know? Uh, don't eat that, that's not uh, uh, green tea ice cream, that's wasabi, <laughs> you know? So you get all these kind of things. And most of the time, you'll notice what is it? What's the trend here? Don't. 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 Yeah, don't. You're telling them don't. Most of the time you're telling them no. Right? Most, of the, most of the things that you're telling them, that you're, most, of the, most of the information that you're giving them is warning. Don't do this. Don't do that. Because you're, you're, you're silent with all the things that they can do. You're, you're just letting them, letting them, them, them happen. You're letting them happen. You're letting them experience their, their own world and their own existence. But you're warning them from danger and from pitfalls. Don't do this. Don't do that. To stop them from harming themselves or something else, right? And this is what essentially we all need. And without that, we have a, a gap of knowledge. Because the, the baby doesn't know that if you if you chew on the iPhone that it could break. He doesn't know that if you pull on the cord, it could rip. He doesn't know that if you stick something in the socket, they, they could be electrocuted. They don't know that. Their perception is that that's just a hole in the wall. That's the perception. It's just a hole in the wall. The fork, it just, you could put it right in there. Or why, yeah. Yeah, or the key or, or, or whatever. Just let me try to stick that right in there. I'll try to cram my finger in there. You know, it's just, that's how it is. You know, that's the perception. That because they're missing out on some things. And so this is where guidance comes in. This is where learning and education comes in. So we need this, you know. So look here. This is where we're going to conclude in the next couple of slides. So we have knowledge, right? We have gained some knowledge. We told the baby, no, this, that, and the other. Or we ourselves learned a few things. We learned the biology, the science, the, the one plus one is two, the ABCs of things. We, we've got that. We've mastered that. We understand all of that. Ba yeah, the basic stuff, even the, the intricate stuff of science, the details. But when is knowledge, when is it uh, insufficient? When is it not enough? Because that can, that can happen. Because, listen, there are a lot of very, very intelligent people in the world. There are a lot of very, very smart, book smart, uh, real life experience, uh, uh, masters of, uh, of, a, of a craft or a trade or a field of study. But you, you can find that even some of those most intelligent people, they have no idea, no clue where they're going to go, what direction they're heading in, what their purpose is. And you can see it in how they live. You know, one, one, one day they, they think that they're going to do this or we should be doing that. The next day they say, oh, wait, we should be doing this or I, this is why I'm living my life. So this is when knowledge isn't just enough. Perception. Because knowledge, listen, our perception is just based off of the things that we've, we've gotten, right? All of the, pretty much all of the stuff that we know that has led to our perception has been given to us. It's been given to us, right? Look at this, perception. We know, we know we should be healthy, right? We know we should exercise, we should eat right. And so um, this guy right here, that's what he's doing. He's, 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 at least he's, he thinks he is. He thinks he is. He thinks he's, uh, taking, he thinks he's taking care of himself. Hmm? What do you think? Do you think he's, you think he's healthy? What if I'm like, hey, listen, um, you want to get married? Does he look okay? He looks like, I mean, you can see his bones. 
You can see most of his bones. I mean, like an elbow here or there, or, you know, something. You, you, a little bit skinnier than me. You might be able to see a little bit skinnier, huh? But you could see, like, he might be, hey, look, he's got his workout clothes on. So he's just working out, you know? The person is actually suffering from anorexia. He's suffering from anorexia. And that's a, that's a disease, you know? It's, a, it's, it's an eating disorder. And that, I'm sure you know what that is, where he's, he's withholding and, and, and refraining from food because he thinks, he perceives himself to be overweight. He knows that being overweight is unhealthy being overweight, depending on where you are in the world, might even be considered unattractive. And he, he understands that. That's what, that's what he understands. He knows that. He knows that this could, this could be bad. But his perception of who he is is way off. It is way wrong. His perception is that, look, I'm overweight. I'm disgusting. I'm terrible. I'm, 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 I'm lowly. I'm, I'm, look at me. I'm, I'm gross. And the only way that I'm going to get better is if I get thinner. And the only way to get thinner, of course, I know, is to diet and to exercise. And so this is what happens. And so a lot of people, they fall into this kind of, this, this disease, and it's based on a, a, a warped perception of reality. A warped more perception more, of reality. More and more, more and more people. And more and more people have developed not just the anorexia, but a lot of different, a lot of different what people are considered to be disorders. Because their, their sense of who they are, their reality is very, very warped. Their perception on, on life is very different. It's very misguided, if you would say, right? Very misguided. So this is a physical thing. Check this out. To test your perception. Something that you probably be familiar with here in New York. What are your thoughts about this image right here? It's bright. It's bright, yeah. What else? Mm, that's good. That's wow. a good yeah, thought. Something that I didn't even think. Well, yeah, definitely wasting a lot of energy. What else do you think? Christmas. Hmm? Christmas. Yeah, it looks like Christmas. There's a, there's, a, there's a star up there. Celebration. Celebration. Holidays. Presents. Beautiful. Wow. Beautiful, perhaps. I mean, if you think like the typical person, when they see this, they get excited. I mean, it's all over the news. They cover it in the news, they, cover, they show it in the newspapers, they put it on TV, like, oh, they're, they, have, they have ceremonies, Christmas tree lighting ceremonies. People take People will visit, uh, where is it, in Rockefeller Center, they have that big Christmas tree in New York. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll make a special hajj to the Rockefeller Center. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to make the off, maybe not, who knows. You know, but they'll make a special trip to see that and they'll get their picture taken in front of it. In front of it. Their yeah. perception of this image is, is very, it's nice, it's warm, it's happy. It's enjoyable. And this is just an example. There are many other things that, that we look at and automatically we have a perception of. We have a reaction to it. Good, bad, indifferent, whatever it may be. So what is it that is the real perspective, right? Because we started with Allah. This is where we came from. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that designed us with His intent, with His creation. And essentially, He's the one that has made things as they are. And with that is the proper perception of, of that reality. It's the proper perception. It's like, we go back to the beginning. It's like someone taking that rock off the ground and then going to give it to their, to their mom as a gift. Unless she was a rock collector. And I don't think she's going to be very happy with that. She's like, what? My daughter gave me a dirty rock from outside on the, on the, on the concrete here. It's like a little piece of concrete. She just gave me this. as a like, hey, mom, thank you so much. I just want to say I love you here. Right? Percep perception of it understanding of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here tells us in the Quran that this previous image, that the idea behind it, the concept of it, not just the, the surface level lights and happiness and gifts and joy and family and celebrations, is the belief that Allah had a son. And this is the season we're in right now, that Allah had a son. Some people subscribe to that belief. Their perception is based on what they've been told, that Allah has a son, and, and to the end of it. But what does Allah say in the Quran? Look here. The heavens almost rupture. They almost rupture from this word. The earth splits open and the mountains collapse in devastation that they attribute to the most merciful of son. So this is giving us a real divine 
perception. The real reality of things. You know, the maker of things understands and knows their reality. You know, you know when, when it's the difference, and I try to sum it up with, with, our, with our wasabi example. You know, the, the, the chef that prepared, oh, let's not go that far. Let's say uh, the one that bought it from the store, right? You guys bought it. And you, you paid for it. You, you're like, okay, we're going to the store. We need some wasabi. So you go to the store and you pick it up. And you know this is wasabi. You bring it in. You know what it's for. You know how to eat it, how much to eat, when to eat it. And then someone comes in that doesn't. He didn't go to the store. He didn't buy it. He doesn't know what it is. And then he comes in and eats it. And he, and he suffers from that. He, he has to pay the price from, from not not using the tools that he was given, his, his eyesight, his hearing, his heart, his, his senses to, to, to gain enough knowledge to understand what this is to have a full, complete perception of his wasabi. So, what about life? Right? And that's what it is. And that's really what it comes down to is what about our life, how we're living, the decisions that we make every single day, we have to make decisions. And those decisions are based on perception. Is this good or is this bad? Is this the right decision or is this the wrong decision? Am I going to get rewarded? Am I going to get punished? Am I going to get in trouble? Am I going to be let off? All that's going to be based on our perception. And the more that we can develop and fine tune our perception of the world around us and our purpose as human beings, the better off we'll be in the end. And so, as people of faith, as Muslims, this is something that, you know, is a, is a blessing. And I, and I, and I say that uh, on a personal note because, you know, at one point, as was mentioned, I wasn't a Muslim. And, and I, and I, and I, and I kind of hinted to you that I, I felt lost as I didn't know where I was, where I was going, where I came from. I had no direction. I had no guidance. It was like a kid without a babysitter, essentially. It's like a kid without a babysitter. I, I, I was just... Like walking in the dark. F yeah, well, fumbling around, walking in the dark, no lights on. And you know, one of the blessings that we, that we have as, as Muslims is that, you know, we, we acknowledge that Allah is the most knowledgeable. He's, he's the all-wise. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. It's Him that we began from, and, and it is to Him that we will end. So we, we understand that. And, and to develop our perception and, and to kind of be beyond ordinary creatures to live just on the surface of life, we have to take advantage of that. You know, we have to take advantage of that. So, you know, and I, and I think that you guys are doing a great, a great thing here um, with your Saturday sessions at home uh, with each other, trying to um, gain more perception and better perspective on life and, and faith and, and how to make those things work together you know, how to make that a cohesive relationship between your faith and your life and the things that you do on a regular basis. So this is just a little bit of what I wanted to share with you guys today and hopefully uh, hopefully it will have some some benefit for you in the future, inshallah. Yeah. You still have 15 minutes. Yeah, if you guys want to add something. Yeah, question or even concern or comments. Yeah, sure, any, anything. Anything? I was wondering from the first quote that we are made weak, mm -hmm. but it says that it lightens our load. How does that lighten our load? I feel like that would make it more difficult for us because we're, we, need, we need somebody to take care of us. Like, not just like as a baby, but... As a, as a, as a grown adult. I think it extends all the way to... Of course, adult. yeah. Somebody Well, the, about that yeah. Listen, there's another, there's another, like another a a a attribute of weakness um, that we have is the ability to control ourselves at times. Like um, in times of anger, some people have a very difficult time controlling anger. Um, at, uh, sometimes of of um, enjoyment. 
or, or um, you know, sometimes people have a hard time controlling their, their need for enjoyment. Um, you know, a lot of people, not just young, you know, very physical weakness, but then like a, a spiritual weakness or an emotional weakness or even a, even a kind of a mental weakness of control. A lot of times we're, we're overcome with, with um, desires of things, you know. So that's the type of weakness that we have, you know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, 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 lightens, he lightens our burdens as, as weak creatures by providing for us many things. He provides us many tools, many avenues. He provides us uh, guidance um, as opposed to walking into the room in darkness. Allah gives us, he gives us the tools to enlighten our lives, to help us better understand who we are. The more you understand who you are, the better off you'll be. The easier it will be for you to live with yourself. You know, the, 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 the more opportunities that you're given, the easier it is for you to, to get on in life. So those are some of the ways that Allah, He, he lightens our load. And, and, and there are a lot of real specific things as well to display Allah's mercy and, and Him wanting to lighten things for us. As you know, in the Quran it says a couple times that Allah wants ease for you and not hardship. He wants ease and not burden for you. And so, um, you, you'll even find in, in the Islamic, like some of the rulings and traditions and the acts of worship that Allah even factors in certain things where a person would need ease. You know, for pray, prayer, for example, which is such an important part of our faith, is um, prayer throughout the day, you know, five times a day. But then in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the legislation of Islam, you know, in these rules, there are times when you can shorten the prayers or you can join them together. You can combine them, you know, if you're traveling or if you're sick or, or if you're scared, that you're able to now take what was considered normal five times a day and you can combine them and you can shorten the prayers. That way it will be easy for you, like fasting for the month of Ramadan. You know, you're, you have to fast for 30 days. But if you're on a journey, if you're sick or if you're unable to do it, then Allah will, He will lighten the load for you and, and He will, you know, He will exempt you from it. You don't have to do it that day. So these things lighten your way. They lighten your burden. Also the burden of sin. You know, we all make mistakes. Allah knows, He says, we, he, we created you in weakness. And He knows that we're going to slip up and we're going we're gonna to be overcome from time to time and we're going to make those mistakes. And so Allah will lighten our burden of sin by forgiving us. He'll forgive us, and he'll, he'll pardon us. And this is something that's so unique um, for Allah, that he, he, he will pardon without anything in return. He doesn't want anything, he will just pardon and forgive. You know, a lot of times, like, when we run into problems with one another, between each other, you know, she said this, or he said that, or they did this, or they took from me, it's so hard to forgive and to pardon without something, some type of initiative, some type of reward for it but the burden of sin is a very very heavy burden you know when you when you begin to think about it you know it's a, it's a burden that weighs on your conscience a lot of times you know like oh man I can't believe I did that and man, I feel bad I shouldn't have done that I know that was the wrong thing to do you feel guilty you feel you feel worried you you feel anxious about mistakes that you made but you know, as as a, as a Muslim, you know that if you ask for forgiveness and you're sincere, then Allah will forgive you, and so that can relieve some of that burden, some of that that anxiety you feel, it can unload a little bit. So, a lot of ways this lightens the load of burden. Anyone else? No. Hmm. What now? Tips. Tips during the holiday season? Yeah. How to face it. How to deal with it. Oh, yeah, it's tough, man. I mean, it can be tough. You, you know, your, your parents are still. Yeah, yeah, my parents are still. Um, they're you still. Go to church, right? My parents go to church, yeah. My parents do go to church regularly. And uh, they celebrate all of the normal American uh, so you, Christian holidays. How do you deal with that? Well, my parents and I. Uh, my parents and I, obviously, we have a lot of differences. We have a lot of commonalities, but a lot of differences. These holiday seasons are very hard to deal with because, uh, you know, um, when I first accepted Islam, um, I learned about participating in holidays of, of other faiths, you know. 
and I learned that you know the significance of that is is essentially like joining them in a type of worship and I learned very early on that Islam was a way of life Islam was something that was part of our life every moment that we were awake not like you know a kind of split up religion where you have your your weekdays and then you have your religious day you have your your like secular worldly activities you do and then you have your your religious activities you do but Islam is like a, a whole thing so everything that we do you know Islam is, is a part of it and part of our worship as Muslims is our holidays you know we have Eid for Ramadan Eid after Hajj we have Friday which is another Eid a great holiday or, or a day that should be that should be recognized as special and so even in our own celebrations and our holidays it's it's a way in which we can honor and thank and worship Allah and so by kind of um, joining in the festivities you're you're including yourself in in essentially this type of thing you know whether you're doing it intentionally or not it's still an act that you know we have to do our best to avoid so that we don't even fall are even guilty of just physically going through the motions like I said we can't we can't try and split things up as Muslims we don't look at things this way oh I'm doing it but I don't actually really intend that behind it I'm, I'm you know I'm, 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 I'm guilty of the sin but my intent is not to be guilty of the sin you know, that's like a type of like philosophy that just it's not real it's just only in it's only in the mind that the person's able to do that but the reality is what it is again it's a real it's like I'm looking at the rock and I can call it a flower all day long but it's still gonna be a rock at the end of the day regardless of how many times it's, oh that's a beautiful flower look it's a rose it's a rose it's so beautiful look at that's a rose I'm gonna put it in my pocket put water you know, no it's still a rock you know so it's tough so you know you, you 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 do what you can. I mean, if you if you if you have things that come up at school or um, among friends, you know you, you got to be you got to be gracious and you got to be polite. You know you should always be kind to people and and respectful of their of their traditions, but at the same time you got to respect your own. You know you have to respect your own traditions and you have to be uh, respectful of your own identity not ready to sacrifice it there's a fine line that has to be walked here you know that you're not going to give up your identity for the sake of someone else's that fine line yeah that fine line is fine yeah it's fine yeah it's your perspective if you know like i work in a corporate world where holiday is part of the job yeah you know but the celebration is part of my job coordinating Mm. So to like help plan the party. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I drew the line. This is my perspective. I drew the line. I coordinate the party. They even asking me, you know, what some of great ideas, you know, this year different than before and stuff like that. Yeah. I have to come up with ideas. Yeah. Like to make this celebration a success, you know, for that. Oh, it's presentation? No. Oh, oh, just the event. event. Oh, okay. So, like, you know, okay, so this Christmas holiday party, what are we going to do? Yeah. You might, you have the ideas, you know, like, okay, let's, try, you know, usually we invite the celebrities, we have foods. Yeah. Cream is part of it. Um, I mean, I have to do what I have to do. It's just that the, the, the true the, the line for me is just not participating. Uh. But I have to do that as part of my job. That's the hardest part for me. Yeah, it's a. Um, I have a lot of um, people in my community that uh, come to me with similar questions because of the the job that they do, um, and it varies. You know, there's people that work in the bank. Um, and, th th and this is not holiday related, this is just a day in and day out deal of interest, you know, which is something that's very, 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 very bad, you know, in, in, the, in our tradition. Then there's people that, um, a cabbie, cab driver, he has his own cab company and, um, you know, he came to me and said, look, um, I got a deal with some hotels 
uh, they call my company and we provide their customers with cab fare, cab, cab fare. And um, a, a, a large portion of our business is between 5 p.m. And, and 2 a.m. And that's shuttling their customers from the hotel to the bar. You know, and they'll tell us, uh, we need one cab to go from the hotel to the bar or to the ABC liquor store. And so he's, he even said, sometimes I find myself, I pick up the customer and I have to drive to the ABC store, which is the liquor store, and I have to wait for him. And then he, has to, he goes in and buys what he wants and he comes back in to the cab and then I have to take him back to the hotel. You know, because the hotel doesn't, uh, you know, New Jersey's real strict on those, those things. Um, he says, so, you know, what do I do? And, you know, it's kind of like your, your job is, there's good parts to it, and then there's a mixture of impermissible things, you know, of, of doubtful things, or even clear, like the bank, for example, you know. A person's working at the bank, and they're like, look, I don't, I don't actually write any loans or, or, or anything. I just work as a janitor there. You know, I'm just working as a janitor. Or I'm just a teller, you know, I just give money and take money. I don't actually, you know, witness anything or, yeah, I don't actually draw up documents. I don't, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, this is a real tricky part. And, and um, you know, um, the Prophet Sallallahu he said that Allah is tayyib. In Allah tayyib. That Allah is tayyib. He means wholesome and good and, and, and essentially perfect for Allah. لا يقبل إلا الطيب That he doesn't accept, except that what's tayyib. It's what's good, what's tayyib, you know. And in this hadith, it talks about, it goes on and it says, uh, you know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he quoted from the Qur'an uh, that Allah ordered the prophets and messengers, um, you know, to, to look for the tayyib. And it's specifically referring to like consuming of wealth and food and, and lifestyle. And it says, you know, you maybe know this hadith, the man that he, you know, he's, he was messy and he was traveling and he raised his hand and he said, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi. And then it says, you know, his food was haram, his clothes were haram, his, his this and that was all haram. It was like essentially mixed up with all that kind of stuff. So this is kind of, this is the difficulty of being where we are, you know, in the, in the, not only in the, in, the, in the place we live, but in the time in which we live. The time we live in. Um, I was actually given a, a lecture this morning um, for my, the match that I, I'm at down in South Jersey. And the topic was about uh, zuhud, which you may know, it means to renounce. And, and, and typically it means like to, to kind of abstain from the world and the pleasures of the world and all that kind of stuff. And so one of the scholars of the passage said, there is no zuhud anymore. Because zuhud is what's with the haram. Like to stay away from the haram. Or, or what's with the halal, you know, to, how you deal. He says, and everything now today, this is a long time ago. He said, everything's become so mixed that there's long no... Long time ago. Long time, yeah, long time ago. Long, like hundreds of years ago. He said, now everything has become so mixed together, halal with haram, that we can no longer identify these two things and that some way, somehow, it's, it's mixed together, you know. And the only thing that we can do now is, is try and, and, and remove ourselves as far as possible from it. I mean, like, look, I rent a house. I rent a house in South Jersey. I, d I didn't buy one because I didn't want to take a loan from the bank. Because right? then I would have to take an interest-based loan and I don't want to get involved with interest. But I'm renting a house. And what do you think my rent money goes to? Yeah. It goes to the owner who is paying the mortgage on the house. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you are involved kind of... I mean like a, like a, you know, a second degree or a third degree, you know. It's involved in... So, I mean, okay. it's the place the time but and and some people have said hey look you know what you're going to pay the guy's mortgage anyway so you might as well do it yourself that way you can at least come away with the house and i said look you know i understand the logic behind that but my main objective is to try and remove myself as far as possible from anything that would be really really guilty you know and so that's what we have to do with our careers and our jobs and stuff like that is you know like you said in the beginning our islam is our whole life it's it's everything that we do, and and you know we have to we have to make decisions based on that that kind of perception of of our faith, you know, and how how deep it needs to run, you know. So if if you think that your planning parties or events that are, you know, 
making you, I mean. No, I stay away from it. Yeah. It's just that I have to do the job part. No, I understand. It's part of the job. No, I understand that. But yeah, like, when the party happens, if you're working it, listen, listen. If you're if you're working in the um, if you're if you're working for um, Miller or Coors, yeah. you're like look, I don't I don't actually drink it, yes. and I don't even serve it. I just am the bottler. I don't even I don't even make it. I'm just the bottler. Yeah. All I do is monitor the machinery that puts the bottle cap on. Yeah. That's all I do. Right. So I'm not actually fully involved with it but you are still in the process of it you're still in the you're still in the process of the support of that thing you know it's like look it's like um this lady she came to me and she said look i want to uh, i work for the bank and they're going to give me a promotion to be a loan officer i said whoa okay i said well are you are you why are you asking me i'm like what do you want me to tell you i mean she says but listen this is why i'm asking because I'm not like the last. She said, in our bank, there's a series of loan officers. It goes through a series, a process of checking. She says, I'm way down on the totem pole. Right? So I have to make a decision, and then I give it to someone else who makes a further decision, and then they give it to someone else, and then it's finalized. So it's not like my decision really counts at the end of the day. It's not like I actually have the final approval. You know, and so she was like trying to like kind of work her way around it and I said look I I I I feel the I feel the pain because you're in limbo and you've come to me with a question because you feel there's a limbo here it's like a little gray area and you you, you know I said but you know we have to like remove ourselves for a minute and then we have to look at it objectively is this you know how far can we push the the, the limits you know I said so you are in fact approving a loan you are in fact a part of the process you are supporting the, 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 the interest-based system of banking, which for some people is what they do, but for us it's, it's, it's like one of the major sins. And then I said, listen, even a person that doesn't do that, so the janitor of the bank, he's still supporting the system of that. And, and after a little bit of research, I said, if the you know, for, for the janitor, because he's not even involved at all. You know, he has no idea what's going on in the bank. He's just cleaning the floors and, and wiping the, de the desks. So look, if they didn't have the interest there anymore, would he still have a job? No, the bank would close. The industry, was, the industry would fold, you know. So, you know, that's what, that's what it is, you know, so, yeah. It's a tough thing. Another guy, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with this example because this was a great, this was a success story because these stories are very, very uh, gloomy at times, you know. The guy, he worked in the restaurant. He was a uh, waiter. He was a great guy, young guy. He, he was just, got just out of college, still kind of getting himself together. And he worked in a restaurant and um, he, um, he came to me one day. He said, listen, you know, I work in a restaurant and um, you know restaurants. I mean, I, I have to serve what the restaurant sells, yeah. you know, and it's not like a halal restaurant I work in. He says, I have a job at the halal restaurant, but unfortunately the halal restaurants don't pay me enough. You know, they've given me a low salary, you know, Muslim business sometimes <laughs> not the best. You know, they underpay me, but, and, but I'm there because I, I don't want to work full time at the, the other restaurant, but I, I, I can't pay my bills. So I said, yeah. He says, so, you know, I have to, I have to serve, you know, he's, he's, it was an Italian restaurant. She's like, you know, so I'm serving the sausage, uh, pasta and I'm serving the wine you know he says he says actually we don't sell wine at the restaurant but people bring wine in it's, it's BYOB or something you know uh, yeah. bring your own bottle you know and in New Jersey people always bring in their own bottle yeah the, the restaurant doesn't sell it but they carry it in with them that's how that's how that's how into it how diseased they are with it. it's like I can't eat without a bottle of wine he says and it's by law that if they bring their own bottle, the server has to do it. You can't let them pour their own glass. You can't just give them the glasses and say, go. You have to take the bottle and you have to uncork it. And then you have to serve it. And so there I am. It's like, you know, there I am. And I'm, I'm, I'm bringing them the sausage or the, the whatever. And then, I'm, and then I'm pouring their wine. And he's like, I can't continue to live. I feel so guilty. I know that it's wrong. He says, but I don't know what to do. I got bills. I got family. I got a life. I got this and the other. And so I was like, look, I understand your reality is your reality. I said, 
I said, what you need to do is get another job. He's like, oh, well, that's easy to say, right? That's easy to say. I'm like, no, no. What I'm saying to you is, your new job, you're going to keep working, but your new job is going to be finding a job to transist into. So you're going to work two jobs. One job is, you keep going with this. I said, if you could afford to pull out, and it wouldn't destroy your life, because that may be a greater evil that you end up out on the street, you know, as opposed to continuing to consume these things that you would end up out on the street, you may lose your family to the end of it. So you keep doing this, and then your second full-time job is looking for another job. So essentially you're working this job in the day, and then at night when you go home, you spend another five, six, seven, eight full-time hours searching for another job, getting your resume, looking for references, and, and looking for that job that you can go to every day, and you can walk out feeling, I'm, 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 I'm satisfied. I'm not, I'm not conflicted. I'm not in, in, I'm not in contradiction with myself or my faith. And you can, you can transist into it. And he's like, I never, I never thought of that. You know, I, I never I thought I that way. Yeah, I never thought to, I never thought to think of it that way. I'm just thinking of, you know, I need to quit and find another job, and that seems impossible. I said, look, set a date for yourself. You know, I told the guy, I said, listen, set a timeline. You know. And he said, yeah, I'm going to set a timeline. And I said, give yourself a couple of months. You start from now. You start working full time with that, looking for a new job. And then by the time you reach that date, it's time to pull the cord. And he did. You know, he did. I said, look, when, 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 you, when you give something up for Allah, Allah will return something in, in greater, uh, it will be greater, greater, a greater return. You know, when you, when you want help from Allah and you do the right things, Allah will, he will certainly do right by you, you know. So that's something that uh, we all have to deal with, you know, those types of things. Anyway. Yes? No? Maybe so? Look, this is good. This is good. This is this topic. It might, you guys might seem all that so far removed from me. Like, I'm not working. I'm not thinking about a career. But, you know, um, a, lot of, a lot of the things that I do throughout the year is I go to colleges, MSAs, Muslim Student Associations. Right? And they invite me to come talk and, and to answer their questions and stuff. And so one of my most, um, or my biggest goals, at, and even college, it's almost too late for that, is that when you go there and I talk to them, I, I, the, my strongest advice to them is that you pick your career now. That you, that you think about what it is that you're going to do for the rest of your life or that you want to do for the rest of your life, you know. Because... This lady that asked me about her new job as a loan officer, she'd been working in the bank for 10, 15 years already. And, you know, she feels as if that's the only thing she has because that's her experience and that's where she's been and she's got a house payment and kids and tuition and, and bills to pay and, and she feels, you know, stuck. So if, if she could rewind 10 years to when she just went into school, she would probably say, look, instead of going into finance, I probably would have went into something else. You know, that way I wouldn't have to deal with this now where I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing with my, with my career? You know, I, it's so hard, you know. So that's something to be thinking about now is what is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to do and what is it that you should do, right? Your perception on the career that you want to have, is it going to be... Uh, uh, satisfying later on not just like I enjoy it but satisfying all around spiritually satisfying is it going to be emotionally satisfying the whole nine you know that's something that you can never start too early yeah, yeah. to begin to consider that kind of thing what you're going to end up doing and, and how you're going to support yourself and your family and things like that 